Well, good afternoon and welcome. I'm Merit Jano, Dean of SEPA, and it's an enormous uh, privilege for me uh, to welcome you and, and to be joined by, I think, uh, one of America's most celebrated diplomats, Ambassador William Burns, who's here to talk to us about his new book, Back Channel, a, mem a Memoir of American Diplomacy and the Case for Its Renewal. Um, I think we're pretty early in your book launch, and we're very honored to have you with us today. Uh, before we begin, let me also thank uh, Avril Haynes, uh, who is Deputy Director of uh, Columbia World Projects uh, here at Columbia, a very important initiative of the university and of President Bollinger. And she's also a fellow, senior fellow at Columbia Law School and also at SEPA. And she has also been someone who has been on the front lines of shaping US uh, policy as deputy director of the CIA and deputy national security advisor uh, to President Obama. And of course, the subjects you'll be discussing today are really very fundamental and core to the work of this school. Um, and so it's meaningful for us to have you here uh, with us. We study international security key regions of the world, humanitarian affairs, the role of diplomacy, multilateral I institutions. It's a core part of our teaching, our research, our graduates move into diplomatic careers as well as um, private sector and NGOs. And we've been doing this for more than 70, 70 years. So uh, we're proud of that history and we're trying to build on that history uh, to equip the next generation uh, for dealing with the challenges facing the United States and the world uh, today. So to hear from you on the importance of diplomacy and what you have seen and learned uh, during your 33-year career in the Foreign Service is, is a very remarkable moment. Uh, I note that Ambassador Burns currently serves as the president of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace which I think may be the oldest think tank in the United States mm -hmm. on international affairs. Um, and of course, he holds the highest rank in the Foreign Service, which is a career ambassador, and I think is the only the second serving career diplomat in history uh, to become Deputy Secretary of State. They won't make that mistake again. <laughs> <laughs> so, you, you, you know, uh, it's hard to, to tell in a word uh, the, the breadth of his experience, but let's just note for our students who may not know all that you've accomplished and the complex roles you have played. Uh, you were Under Secretary of Political Affairs, Ambassador to Russia, Assistant Secretary of State for Near Eastern Affairs, Ambassador to Jordan, among other significant posts. Uh, you speak multiple languages, Arabic, um, Russian, um, maybe French as well. Um, maybe. Uh, uh, I saw that in one bio, not another. Um, so it's really fantastic. Um, uh, uh, and, you know, the reviews have been great. Um, and uh, the Washington Post called it masterful. David Ignatius wrote, it is a wise and rueful account, and so I'm looking forward to hearing both, both of those elements <laughs> as we learn more from you today. And let me just say that I, I, uh, I really hand this over to Avril, uh, whose huge depth of experience, uh, having worked in the State Department and in the White House and the CIA as Deputy Director, also as uh, senior legal positions, legal advisor to the National Security Council. Um, I know you've been in some um, hot spots together, so thank you for joining us. And I'll let you take us forward. Thank you. My greatest credit is that I get to now embarrass Bill a little bit about history <laughs> between us, which is to say that um, it, it honestly is hard to imagine or hard to articulate adequately the extraordinary impact that Bill has had on foreign policy in the United States. And, and I think, and I've gotten the chance to see this firsthand in some respects, but the skill with which uh, he has managed problems, the extraordinary creativity that he brought to trying to solve new ones and, and create initiatives, and the, the really, the, 
kindness with which he mentored many people around him, including myself, on so many occasions, and the real integrity and grace with which he conducted himself every day in the department. And, uh, and that's something that really sticks with you as you're sort of growing up in government and uh, trying to manage these extraordinary issues that come across your desk. And um, I'll just tell you three things as I was growing up in government that really crystallized, in my view, a sense of who Bill is beyond the resume in a way. And one of them was being uh, a sort of a line attorney at the State Department. I had no idea um, really who Bill Burns was, but you know, he was on these memos that you would send up, right? <laughs> you know, he was the political uh, affairs undersecretary, or he was in these different positions, right? And you would, um, everybody wanted to send their memo to Bill because they knew that he would exercise extraordinary judgment in dealing with the issues that were coming across his desk, that he would read it carefully, that he would be somebody who would actually respond to it in an effective way. And that was something that people saw as a sort of sign of respect. And also, the smartest lawyer in our office used to say about Bill, oh, he's really smart, which scared the hell out of most <laughs> of us, right? So what could that possibly mean? And then when I went to, honestly, the, the White House as a lawyer, I got to backbench a lot of principals committee meetings and deputies committee meetings that Bill was at. And what was extraordinary about Bill was that you'd have this fight over an issue, you know, some question about how are we gonna approach X country on Y issue and so on. People would have all kinds of opinions. And then finally somebody would turn to Bill and say, Bill, what do you think? And he has this very soft voice and everybody would lean in and he'd have the answer, you know? And you sort of, eventually in these meetings, you'd start to say, please let Bill speak. <laughs> because <laughs> honestly, like, maybe we could get to the answer faster. And then in the intelligence community, he was known for having the best cables, and you see this through the book, right? In terms of describing what was happening in a country, about his meeting, about bringing in the right details, the sort of salient moments. And I have to say, it's one of the things I wanted to sort of open up to ask you this very broad question about the book, but you make a case for diplomacy like no other I've seen in this book. It's extraordinary. It's both in the sense of how important it is, but also how you conduct diplomacy. What are sort of the key tools? And I wonder, why now? Why do you see this as so critical, in a sense? Well, first I should say thank you um, very much to both of you for those extraordinarily generous words. If I was a really smart diplomat, I'd get up, say thank you, and walk out right now. Cause, um, um, but it's, and it's great to be here as well. I am the proud father of a 2016 master's graduate from SIPA, so I have enormous admiration um, for this institution and for the work um, that's done here as well. I mean, I guess I've real to answer your question. Um, you know, in the three and a half decades I spent as a professional American diplomat, I've never seen a moment when diplomacy mattered more to advancing American interests in the world or been more adrift. Um, we're no longer the only big kid on the geopolitical block uh, with the rise of China, the resurgence of Russia. Um, we can't get everything our own way anymore or, you know, by force alone. Um, I would still argue that the United States, and I don't mean this as a statement of American arrogance, still has a better hand to play than our rivals do, at least as far out into the 21st century as I can see. It's not just our military and economic leverage, it's also our capacity for drawing on alliances and mobilizing coalitions of countries. That's what sets us apart from lonelier powers like China and Russia today. Diplomacy ought to be our principal tool for taking advantage of those assets. But what I worry about, and I was a large part of what animated me to try to write this book, um, is that we're corroding that tool and squandering that asset today. I would quickly add that the drift in American diplomacy was not invented by Donald Trump. Um, that, you know, it's been an episodic feature, I think, of American foreign policy since the end of the Cold War. At first, I think, in the 90s, we became a little bit complacent, um, simply because diplomacy didn't seem to matter so much at a time when we were the singular dominant player on the international landscape. And then, of course, came to the, the deep shock to our system of 9-11, and a tendency to further invest in military and intelligence tools of policy, and to treat diplomacy as kind of an under-resourced afterthought. But, I do believe that in the Trump era over the last two and a half years, 
um, you've seen an acceleration of that drift and a president who's made the drift in diplomacy infinitely worse than what it was before. And that's not just in terms of the tangible measures, you know, cuts in budgets, significant reductions in the numbers of young people applying to join the American Foreign Service. You know, we made painstakingly slow progress over the course of my career to make the American Diplomatic Service look more like the society we represent in terms of gender and ethnic diversity. When I came into the Foreign Service in the early 1980s, most American diplomats looked like me. You know, nine out of 10 American diplomats were white, only a quarter were women. By the time I left, the gender balance was close to 50-50, although woefully inadequate at senior levels. But what we've seen over the last couple of years is to reverse that trend. And then I would add the particularly pernicious practice of going after individual career civil servants simply because they worked on controversial issues in the last administration. So all of that, in, ta in a tangible way, corrodes, I think, you know, that important tool of diplomacy. But then you have the less tangible, a president who, when asked about a year ago about whether he was concerned about senior vacancies in the State Department, which to this day are at a record level, said, not so, I'm not really that concerned because I'm the only one who matters. That's a diplomacy of narcissism, not of institutions. And at a time, as I said before, when diplomacy ought to matter more um, to the United States, and I would argue for you know, whatever hopes there are of reshaping international order to fit today's realities, um, you know, we're, we're gonna miss that moment, is my fear. You, you have a whole series of stories through the book, um, and you know, early on you talk about working for former Secretary Jim Baker. Mm -hmm. One of the uh, places where it struck me, I mean, it was fascinating to read about um, how he used diplomacy to really further the president's agenda and the United States. And, and one of them is in going after support for the UN Security Council resolution that ultimately authorized force against uh, Saddam Hussein mm -hmm. in the context of um, if he didn't pull out of Kuwait. Right. And I wonder, can you talk a little bit about that and, and you know, sort of the diplomacy that went into that and then also the, the really remarkable and dramatic meeting of Baker yeah. and Aziz that followed? Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I was very fortunate as a pretty young diplomat to work on the staff of Secretary of State James Baker in the George H.W. Bush administration. And again, as many of you will recollect, not a lot of students in the audience, um, you know, this, this was a moment just after the end of the Cold War when the United States really was unrivaled on the international landscape. It was one of those plastic moments that come along pretty rarely in statecraft. It was true in 1945 when you had you know, real transformations after the end of the Second World War, it was true in 1989, and I would argue it's true today, which is why I feel a sense of urgency about the themes in this book. But at that moment in 1989, the end of the Cold War, the collapse of the Soviet Union, you had a group of leaders in President Bush Sr., in Baker, Secretary of State, Brent Scowcroft, the National Security Advisor, Colin Powell was then the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, that disagreed with one another sometimes but had a really acute sense of how to take advantage of that moment and understanding that it wasn't gonna last forever. Um, you know, they knew that the sort of Pax Americana would inevitably, you know, begin to run out of steam, whether it was through our own unforced errors, which came faster than they anticipated a decade later in the, in the second Iraq war, um, but also just in the kind of natural order of events. And I learned an awful lot from Baker as both a Secretary of State and as a negotiator um, there, there was the, you know, the period of time that you described when you know, Baker and Bush put together an unprecedented international coalition, not so much because of m military necessity, because the truth is the U.S. military could have pushed Saddam out of Kuwait, but because they understood that plastic moment on the international landscape, and they wanted to create a precedent in which the United States could use its singular power to work with other countries and create a kind of precedent for a, a different kind of order in the world. And so, you know, Baker went on this uh, series of tin cup trips I mentioned in which he basically raised money from the Saudis, the Kuwaitis, you know, the Japanese and others to pay for the war. So, you know, the United States Treasury actually didn't pay anything for the war. 
um, you know, uh, built support for a series of UN Security Council resolutions which provided a kind of legitimacy for that effort. And then in the meeting that he had with Tariq Aziz in January of 1991, not something that was necessary to do, but he wanted to demonstrate, the president wanted to demonstrate that by meeting with the Iraqi foreign minister, you know, we were going the extra mile to show that we wanted to avoid a use of force if we could. And, you know, the Iraqis were uh, way too stubborn and too dug in at that point to give, although there was a lot of anxiety, I remember, on the plane ride going over that the Iraqis would do the smart thing, which was to have a partial withdrawal and begin to undercut um, the international coalition. But Baker, on a lot of other occasions, um, was fascinating to learn from. I mean, he demonstrated you know, that persistence and stamina matter as much in diplomacy as anything else, especially with Hafez al-Assad, who was the previous bloody dictator of Syria, the father of the current bloody dictator of Syria. I remember one meeting between Assad and Baker um, right after the Gulf War in the run-up to the Madrid Peace Conference went on for nine hours straight. Now, Assad, I always thought, had a surgically improved bladder because he would sit there and not move, I mean, literally motionless, except for drinking cup after cup of sweet Arab tea, um, which is the custom. And of course, Baker, not wanting to be outdone by anyone else, would match him cup for cup. About four hours into this nine-hour session, the guy, a wonderful diplomat who was our ambassador in Damascus at the time, cracked and invented, he said, I've got an urgent phone call to make. Well, he had urgent business, but it wasn't a phone call. Um, and so Baker and Assad then spent the next 45 minutes making fun of the sort of bladder-challenged American career, career <laughs> diplomats. And Baker also had this kind of rich vocabulary of Texas expressions, which challenged, we had a really wonderful Arabic language interpreter in the State Department at the time, but Baker would throw these phrases at out like, you know, that dog won't hunt, meaning <laughs> your, idea, your idea isn't going to work. And you'd see these kind of Arab autocrats <laughs> trying to figure out what the hell he was talking about. Another of his favorite ones was, don't make me leave that dead cat on your doorstep. <laughs> and this meant don't, you don't want to be the one I blame for the failure of this process. But I mean, I remember the poor Arabic language interpreter <laughs> going through contortions to try to, you know, get this mess. But eventually they understood, and what they understood more than their you know, expanding array of Texas aphorisms, um, was they understood that Baker meant business um, and that he was credible, that he had a sense of strategic empathy about what their constraints were and what their agenda was. He had a really keen sense of American power, and nobody doubted his word. So um, it was quite remarkable in that period. It, in hindsight, it looks like whether it was the Desert Storm Coalition, the Madrid Peace Conference with Arabs and Israelis, uh, or the reunification of Germany within NATO less than a year after the fall of the Berlin Wall. You know, that in hindsight, that seems kind of inevitable and foreordained. It sure didn't look that way at the time. And it took the skill of that group of people as much as anything else um, to pull it off. You talk about the importance of that credibility and, and the trust that develops in these relationships as being so important also to the work that you did with Libya and mm -hmm. Gaddafi in mm -hmm. getting them to give up their nuclear and chemical weapons program. And I, I, I thought that was really interesting, sort of understanding, and it also is a potential precursor to the work that you did with Iran and, and others in the future. And I wonder you know, if you could just talk about that and how it shaped your thinking for back channel work yeah. moving forward, but also you have to tell the story about sitting with Gaddafi in his various outfits <laughs> because yeah. there's some pretty impressive. Now, Muammar Gaddafi was by far the weirdest foreign leader I ever had to deal with. And this was an earlier episode of back channel negotiations where we were quietly, this was just after 9 11, trying to talk Gaddafi into accepting responsibility for the Libyan act of terrorism, which killed 270 people. At Lockerbie over Scotland, a Pan Am jetliner that was brought down, and then basically get out of the business of terrorism and ultimately give up his rudimentary nuclear program as well. And so I would go to see Gaddafi, and sometimes, um, you know, it was like that old John Candy, Steve Martin movie, Planes, Trains, and Automobiles, where you'd, you know, you'd use every known form of transportation to get to his tent in the middle of the desert someplace. But I vividly remember one meeting because.
he had this really um, disconcerting habit of in mid-conversation just staring up at the ceiling for three or four minutes. And I assumed he was like collecting his thoughts or something, but as I said, it was kind of disconcerting when you're you know, an American diplomat, you're used to carrying on a conversation. But he was, as Avril was suggesting, a flashy dresser. And so on this one occasion, he was wearing what can only be described as a pajama top with photos of dead African dictators on it. And so I would pass the three or four minutes by trying to figure out how many of those <laughs> dictators I could identify. And he, he actually paused enough where I was getting pretty good at it by the end. <laughs> um, but, you know, I mean, I think that was a lesson. If you think of back channels um, where, you know, we didn't have formal relations with Libya, um, where the depth of mistrust and grievance on both sides, and particularly on our side, given, you know, the, uh, the behavior of Gaddafi over a number of years, um, meant that, you know, it would be very difficult to get anywhere under public scrutiny. Um, as is often the case in back channel talks, there was a third party, in this case the British, who played a hugely important role in facilitating those conversations. When we later did this with the Iranians over the nuclear issue, it was the government of Oman. Um, so, you know, I learned a lot in that experience that you tried to apply later on, a decade later with the Iranians. Yeah. I, I do I, I, to this day, I have never felt comfortable wearing pajamas, though. For, <laughs> yeah. Especially now with dictators. Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. I, um, I want to turn to Russia, but before I do so, I think there's one other thing that I really appreciated from reading the book, which is uh, you talk about really these sort of very granular tools that are used in diplomacy. And, and two of them that you sort of highlight, I think, one is the use of principles to govern our policy, you know, whether it was in the context of the breakup of the Soviet Union or reunification of Germany and so on. And I wonder if you could talk about why it is that that's a useful way to think about it, why identifying these sort of principles and how it gets used uh, through the process is so helpful. And you also talked about this sort of suggestion that you made for, did you call them Iran watchers? Mm -hmm. You know, this kind of sense of having some folks in areas around Iran sort of plan in advance who had language skills and so on. You, you should explain it and sort of- Yeah, no, I mean, on, on the tools. second point, um, you know, what we tried to do, I think this was, this would have been like 2004, 2005. I was exiting a job as the head of the Middle East Bureau in the State Department, about to go to Moscow as ambassador. And I wrote a transition memorandum to Condoleezza Rice, who was becoming the Secretary of State. And one of the things I suggested, um, you know, was that, you know, we needed to look ahead to the moment when we might have diplomatic relations with Iran. And in the meantime, we needed to accept the fact that our ignorance about Iran um, you know, was pretty great. And so borrowing from the model that um, the Roosevelt administration and its predecessors had set up when we didn't have uh, diplomatic relations with the Soviet Union in the 1920s and early 1930s, and they had set up this program of Russia watchers in the Baltic states and you know other areas around the Soviet Union, trained people over a long period of time in the Russian language um, and in history and you know everything that you'd need to understand Russia better. I proposed and, and Secretary Rice later adopted this approach to doing this in Iran. So we, you know, in a systematic way began to train more Farsi speakers in the US Foreign Service and then base them in places, you know, on the periphery of Iran which, you know, I think someday is going to pay dividends, uh, maybe not anytime soon. Um, the point that the question you asked earlier about principles is just, again, something that I think Baker demonstrated very clearly, which is if you didn't frame issues yourself, somebody else was going to frame it for you. So, for example, when the Soviet Union was collapsing, um, you know, he gave a speech and we had given, uh, suggested to him a set of principles that shaped that speech in which he laid out a whole series of things which would guide American policy toward all, toward all these newly independent states. You know, that they needed to respect the territorial integrity of one another, um, that, you know, that peaceful means should be used to satisfy, to settle grievances amongst them. You know, democratic principles ought to guide the way in which their governments were put together. Now, not all of the largely autocratic leaders of these new independent states paid much attention to this. I remember going with Baker to Uzbekistan in early 1992, and the then president, Karimov, very proudly took off the top of his desk this laminated card with all of Baker's principles on it and said, I take this with me everywhere. And I remember 
riding with Baker back to the plane, and he said, yeah, that guy's about as interested in those principles as I am in Uzbek folk music. <laughs> but, um, so he had, a, he had a healthy skepticism about how far principles could take you. But I do think it helps um, to you know, frame challenges. Can I ask one question before we sure. move uh, on to Russia, but it, maybe it'll inform that, is, I mean, you, you talk about this as a plastic moment, and mm -hmm. that's how I recall it as well. Did we use it well enough? In 89? That whole period, yeah. Could we have gotten to a more stable international order if... Well, I, I mean, I think, you know, there's no, there's nothing perfect about American diplomacy. I mean, even in the post-World War II period, the last of the big plastic moments before 1989, I think that particularly gifted group of statesmen, you know, working for President Truman got a lot of things right. Um, I think in 1989, more right than wrong. Um, you know, I think a fair criticism of Bush and Baker was the Balkans, you know, in the early 1990s. Um, you know, despite their, I think, unusual blend of both kind of audacity and risk taking over German reunification and Desert Storm and dealing with Saddam Hussein, you know, they, they, they had also blended that with a certain amount of restraint. But, you know, by 1992, President Bush was totally consumed by a re-election campaign that didn't, did not end well for him. Um, and so I think, you know, that administration, all of us left an inheritance of the Balkans, which was a very complicated one for the Clinton administration when it came in. But I think by and large, recognizing that perfect is rarely on the menu um, in diplomacy, um, I think it was a really impressive period in American statecraft. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. No, well, I, I, it does set up well. I think one of the things that, I mean, you have such a long history studying Russia. And, right. um, and I, you know, one of the things it seemed to me that you do a very nice job of is really helping the reader understand how the history coming out of the breakup of the Soviet Union really shapes, in a way, our relationship and the psychology of Russia today. And I wonder if you could just Speak about that a little bit, and what are the lessons we should be drawing from that? Today? Well, I mean, I've always thought, having served as a diplomat first in our embassy in Moscow in the early 1990s in Boris Yeltsin's Russia, and then later as ambassador 10 years later um, in Vladimir Putin's Russia, that you can't understand the smoldering aggressiveness of Putin's Russia unless you understand the really curious combination of hope after the end of communism and humiliation with the Soviet Union's collapse as a major power, the sense of disorder that was Russia in the 1990s when I served there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the economy was flat on its back. I remember vividly, because one of the fascinating things about serving as a diplomat in Russia is just getting out of Moscow and St. Petersburg. Um, you know, 11 time zones, just a kaleidoscope of people and challenges. Um, and so, you know, during that period in the 90s, I can remember scenes vividly of you know, um, you know, one time I remember sitting in the embassy one afternoon uh, up on the ninth floor of the embassy and a guy across the street in broad daylight pulled out a, a, um, a grenade launcher and fired a rocket propelled grenade through the wall of the sixth floor in the embassy which detonated in a copying machine. Fortunately, it didn't kill anybody. But this was Moscow in the 90s. It didn't <laughs> seem that unusual for somebody to be walking down the street, one of Moscow's main thoroughfares, with an RPG. Um, and there were an amazing number of the usual suspects who were rounded up by the Russian security services then. I remember another instance going to see the deputy mayor of Moscow, whose office was close to the embassy in the middle of the winter. And you go down, I walk down there as I'm getting ready to walk into the entrance to the building. Here are seven guys in business suits lying face down in the snow, spread eagled. And these guys in paramilitary uniforms with black ski masks, heavily armed, standing over them. And nobody acted like this was unusual. But this was, you know, the head of um, Yeltsin's uh, presidential guard had a business dispute. And this, in the mid-1990s, was how you registered your concern about business disputes in Moscow. And I walked into the meeting with the deputy mayor who acted like, you know, nothing was unusual. Um, and then I remember most vividly going to Chechnya uh, during the first Chechen war in, the sp this was the winter of 1994-95. And I remember driving in from the neighboring Russian Republic of Ingushetia um, and seeing the Red Army. 
Now, this was the Red Army that was supposed to be able to reach the English Channel in 48 hours, which looked a lot more like a street gang. I mean, albeit a street gang with nuclear weapons. But they had destroyed 40 square blocks of the center of Grozny, the capital of Chechnya. You know, the scenes of human suffering were incredible. But it was also a scene of the humiliation of Russia. And for people like Putin and those who had been professionally trained like him and the KGB, it's not something that they forgot. So Putin came to power now almost 20 years ago, I think, determined to do two things. One was to restore the power of the Russian state. Um, and the second was to restore Russia to the table of great powers in the world. And he you know, has become, over those 20 years, I think, a very combustible combination of grievance and ambition and insecurity. I vividly remember my first meeting with him as the newly arrived uh, American ambassador in the summer of 2005. And new ambassadors come to present their credentials, their letter from the American president at the Kremlin. Kremlin, as many of you know, I'm looking at Peter Clement, um, uh, understand that uh, that the Kremlin is built on a scale that's meant to intimidate visitors, especially new ambassadors. So you come in, you walk through these huge ornate halls down long corridors. You come to the end of this one huge hall and there are these two-story bronze doors. You're kept waiting there for a little bit just to let all this sink in. And then the door cracks open a little and out comes Vladimir Putin. Now Putin, despite his bare-chested persona, is not the most physically intimidating person in the world. He's about five, six. But he carries himself with great self-assurance. And so he comes striding toward me, looking me straight in the eye, which is his custom. Um, and before I got a word out of my mouth, let alone handed the letter over, said, you Americans need to listen more. You can't have everything your own way anymore. We can have effective relations, but not just on your terms. So you know, this was vintage Putin in my experience. It was not subtle. It was kind of defiantly charmless. Um, but he delivered a very clear message of how he saw U.S.-Russian relations. And you know, I think it leaves us in a very complicated position today because I think both of us, the United States and Russia, have had our own illusions about that relationship over the last quarter century. Um, but I think what we're faced with, if we're honest about it, is a pretty narrow band of possibilities from the sharply competitive to the nastily adversarial. And it doesn't mean that diplomacy doesn't matter. Because what I really worry about, this is the last thing I'd say on this question, is that um, you know, we're, we're, we're watching the collapse of the old guardrails in the relationship, you know, the arms control architecture that had been built up since the late Soviet period, not just the demise of the INF Treaty, the Treaty on Intermediate Nuclear Range Forces, but also the New START agreement that reduced and regulated strategic nuclear weapons, which expires at the beginning of 2021. And, you know, in its current trajectory, um, that treaty is also going to expire. And I think both of us, Americans and Russians, but also the you know future of international order are going to suffer if that happens. Yeah. May we, um, unless you have one last question, perhaps we should open up to our audience. For yeah, absolutely. I, why don't we do that and, and give them a chance, and then if there's space, we can. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Because we have a lot of expertise yeah. with us, and you. Yeah already started us into so many fascinating routes and I see if not would anyone like to lead us off or we'll be happily keep going I should say <laughs> please Adam yeah. if you'd like to go to the hi first thank you so much for coming in that wonderful sure. dialogue right at the beginning of your conversation you talked about the sort of degradation of American diplomacy and statecraft, going back over time yes. and then accelerating in the last two and a half years, as you put it. If you look at what's happened, whether it's, um, for example, the, the difficulty of recruiting people, the attacks on career self, civil servants, so the architecture um, of, of diplomatic capacity, and then also the, the, cha the challenges to our reputation and trust. If you look at all of those things together, which of those things do you think can be um, turned around relatively quickly, maybe in 2021, who knows? Which of those things will take multiple years to get back to a better place? And which of those things have we fundamentally lost hmm. and will never come back? That's um, a really good question, or a series of questions. Um, I'll start with the broadest part of your question. I mean, I really do fear that right now the United States in the Trump era 
is digging a hole for ourselves on the international landscape at a moment of profound transformation on that landscape. We'll eventually stop digging. I hope soon, and I've never been a particularly partisan person, so I've become more, I guess, in recent years. But um, I hope soon, because there's a big difference between four years and eight years, in my view. Because when we stop digging, we're going to climb back to the top of that hole, and I fear we're going to look at on a landscape that's hardened against our interests and against values that are not just American values, but that matter at a time when the contest in ideas between democratic or more open political systems and authoritarian systems, I think, is pretty intense. Um, so I fear that some of the damage we're doing to ourselves, precisely because it, it comes at a moment of such change internationally, and precisely because it's not as if other players are going to wait till we get our act together. You know, adversaries are taking advantage, allies start to lose faith and hedge, and the institutions that we work so hard to help build and defend, and, and that I would be the first to admit are desperately in need of adaptation now, uh, they begin to teeter as well. Um, having said that, I think you, know, you can uh, recover lost ground in some areas. Some of it with regard to the State Department itself. While it will take a lot longer to fix than it has taken to break, you, you can do some things that I think will attract you know, the best young and not so young people in our society to come into the Foreign Service. I think you can restore a sense of confidence in American leadership. I don't think it's impossible to begin to bridge the disconnect which exists today between people like me, card-carrying members of the Washington establishment, and lots of American citizens who don't really need to be persuaded of the importance of American engagement in the world, um, but wonder about our capacity for disciplined engagement in the world because they look at Iraq 2003 or the global financial crisis as well. There are things you can do to reassure allies. Even though I, I accept and believe that Asia is increasingly the center of gravity in the global, you know, for both geopolitically and geoeconomically. I would actually argue that if you have a new president replace Donald Trump in 2021, their first stops ought to be in this hemisphere, in Canada and Mexico, as well as in Europe. In Europe, because despite the rise of China, the resurgence of Russia, the dysfunction in the Middle East, which continues to capture our attention, um, that you know that makes actually transatlantic relations matter more rather than less and canada and mexico because that's the natural strategic home base for the united states i mean it takes a remarkable kind of diplomacy to piss off the canadians and that's what we've managed to do in recent years so those are those are the more straightforward things that you can do early on other things are going to be more complicated you know persuading congress to provide resources to not only reanimate diplomacy, but provide for a better balance across the tools of American straightcraft is going to be hard. You know, the dysfunction and polarization in Washington are such that it's very, very difficult, as many of you know, to get things done. Um, and that's going to strain the capacity of, you know, even the most gifted um, new American president. Um, so a lot of damage is being done right now. And as I said, it's the intersection of that damage and a moment on the international landscape, which is plastic, mm -hmm. um, which I think creates the greatest opportunity cost. Mm -hmm. So the sooner we can stop digging, the better, would be my view. Thank you very much. I, I think uh, Mas um, Matthew has been waiting. Would you like to go to a mic just so we can pick it up for the nice. thousands that nice are listening to see you. online? <laughs> So first, uh, Ambassador, thank you very much for your service and your, your mentorship and guidance of, of those of us who served with you in government. It was always a great pleasure. That's great uh, to my see My name you. is um, Matthew Murray, and I'm currently an adjunct professor at Columbia School of International Affairs and um, a formerly a member of the Obama Administration Commerce Department. Um, Ambassador, when, when you were working um, under the Clinton uh, Secretary of State period, you were able to fashion what I thought was a pretty formidable new initiative called economic statecraft that was designed to use both domestic tools of economic um, growth and you know, our, our ability to shape the international economic environment through free trade negotiations, through a more aggressive approach to exports, and through, um, most importantly, perhaps instituting the rule of law as part of that uh, mm -hmm. package. 
And so I, I wonder if you could reflect back on that a bit for this audience about whether you think we had enough political will behind the push for economic statecraft, or, or whether, in fact, it, be, it was sort of trumped by geopolitics at critical moments, whether um, s traditional security sort of issues overtook economic statecraft at critical moments, and we weren't able to deliver on the promise of it. Thank well, you. well, it's great to see you, uh, Matthew. Um, the, no, the honest answer is um, no. I mean, I don't think we did as good a job as we could have done to better integrate, um, you know, geoeconomic issues into more traditional um, national security policy. It's been a continuing challenge through almost all of my career um, as in the State Department. When George Shultz was Secretary of State through much of the 1980s, he pushed very hard to try to um, you know, better integrate economic issues. He had been Secretary of the Treasury, he had been Secretary of Labor. I mean, he had a really good sense of that. Baker did as well. You know, he had been Secretary of the Treasury before, too. Um, but you know, all too often, I think, we tend to you know, not put as much emphasis into issues of economic statecraft as we ought to. And I think that's one of the lessons. Looking ahead, getting back at the answer to your question, Sir, about you know how how you begin not just to repair the damage but to build American statecraft in a direction which is likely to be more successful in the 21st century. It means, you know, not only strengthening the the tools with which we look at those economic issues and better integrate them. Um, it also means you know looking at how you attract talent that can deal knowledgeably with issues of technology because it's the revolution in technology that's going to transform. I think the way the U.S. interacts in the world more than anything else. It means bringing in expertise on issues like climate change as well, the single biggest existential threat out there for the United States and the, and the rest of the international community. So it's, it's one of a series of um, challenges that I think we'll face. So it's not going to be enough just to start repairing the damage. We have to look ahead at the same time. And that's one of the areas in which I think it will be most important to do that. Thank you. I think we have a few folks lined up, so we might take a couple questions, sure. if you don't mind, starting with uh, Peter Carman. No? Sure. Hi, Peter. Thank you. Welcome. It's a pleasure to have you here, and thanks for a great book. And Thank thanks you. for your service. It was always a pleasure to work with you. I have a question that comes from something I heard yesterday. We had Alyssa Slotkin here at Alumni uh -huh. Day, an CIPA alum, and she said one of her tasks as a Michigan congressperson is to talk to people about foreign policy in ways that they understand so they can see the relevance for their day-to-day -day needs, which I thought was really powerful. Yes. And apropos that, you made a comment now about you're not particularly partisan. And I was thinking if our State Department people go out and talk to regular folks out in the Midwest, say, how do they deal with the question about partisanship? And I'm curious about your time in the department. Mm -hmm. Did you ever get a sense that people talked a lot about their personal political views? No, I mean, you know, notwithstanding the view of the current White House, which seems to see the State Department as this den of deep state recalcitrants, um, that's not been my experience. You know, I mean, most of my colleagues, career public servants, whether foreign service or civil service, are almost loyal to a fault in a sense. You know, they want to be led well. They want a sense that their expertise is taken into account, not always heeded. And it's not as if the Foreign Service has a monopoly on wisdom. I mean, as you can read in the book, I get a lot of things wrong, too. Um, but they want to be treated with some degree of professional respect. Um, but it's not a particularly partisan. I mean, people work very hard um, to follow the direction that an elected leadership is set. Um, and that's not an easy thing to do sometimes. There were moments when I disagreed with not for party political reasons, but I just disagreed with a particular set of choices that were being made, like in the run-up to the Iraq War in 2003. But in a disciplined uh, service, you know, you have an obligation not to run off to the New York Times to complain about it, but to do the best you can. I mean, you can't have a U.S. military, you know, that in which battalion commanders faced with a lawful order, say, well, I'd rather turn left than turn right. You, you can't run a government that way. On the other hand, there is an equally important obligation um, to be honest about your concerns within a system. 
because you know any institution, whether it's the State Department or anything else, um, that doesn't create that kind of an atmosphere is going to be a weaker institution as well. And so that's why in the run-up to the Iraq War, some colleagues of mine and I tried as imperfectly as we did um, to raise concerns and to puncture the what we saw to be the recklessly rosy assumptions about advocates for war in that period. So, no, I don't. I mean, people, you know, have their own political views. They vote in elections and they vote for, you know, candidates of different parties. Um, but, but I think it's a huge mistake um, to think that there's a deep state, you know, in the State Department. I just don't buy that at all. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Can, can I ask you before the next question, but just to, on that point, Bill, you talk about one of your regrets in the mm -hmm. context of the Perfect Storm memo that you yeah. just referenced. Can you just talk about that? Because I think a lot of students right now are thinking about a career in government, and there's a lot of concern about what if I disagree with the policies? What if I you know, put myself into these positions? You know, I think yeah, well, I mean, it's a really good question, Avril. I mean, I think um, you, you, know, you have an obligation, as I was saying before, um, not only to be disciplined and you know, trying as best you can to implement choices that are made by an elected leadership. But you have an equally important obligation to be honest about concerns, however inconvenient they may be. And so in this one instance, I think it was the summer of 2002, two colleagues of mine in the Near East Bureau of the State Department, which I led at the time, had what was um, by far the most depressing brainstorming session of our careers, where we sat down for several hours one afternoon and tried to list all the things that we thought could go wrong after Saddam Hussein was toppled from power in Iraq. And I, I never thought, well, I'm not trying to be dismissive of the military challenges, I never thought that the military challenge of overthrowing Saddam was the biggest uh, question before us. The biggest question was what would happen on the day after. Um, and so we, we, this was literally more a hurried list of horribles than it was a coherent analysis. And we got it, if you reread it today, we got it about half right and half wrong. But it was an honest effort. And so, you know, I, I always used to try to encourage that atmosphere in the State Department when I got to more senior positions because it's not healthy if people feel as if they can't voice those kind of concerns. Um, in fact, I think it creates deeply unhealthy institutions and, and policy processes as well. I have enormous respect for people who chose to resign there were three, I think, in the State Department in the run-up to the war in Iraq in 2003. There were about 20 over policy in the Balkans in the early 1990s who just could not in good conscience, uh, you know, continue to serve uh, in, you know, uh, with policies that they just believed were fundamentally wrong. I knew, you know, many of the people who resigned in both of those instances. There are a number of people who have resigned in the last couple of years because they can't in good conscience um, support this administration. I have huge respect for that. Those are difficult choices to make, not just ethically or professionally, but in family terms too. You've been in a profession for 20 years. You're saving money for your kids to go to college. I mean, those are not easy choices to make, which only increases my respect um, for those that make them. I do, however, think that there is also an honorable path within a system, you inevitably are going to feel like you're an enabler, and it's hard to avoid that. Um, but I think as long as you're honest about your concerns, that you know, that also represents uh, you know, a, a worthy course to try to take anyways. Yeah. You, so because yeah. of time, may I just collect two more questions, and then we'll let you have your concluding okay. remarks. Sure. No, I'm well, thank you, Ambassador Burns, for being here. And right. um, thank you for sharing your um, your experience, and I look forward to reading your book. Oh, good. I hope you enjoy it. Um, so about two years ago, you wrote an opinion piece in the New York Times entitled, How We Fool Ourselves on Russia. Um, in this article, you discussed um, what needed to be done um, and towards Russia, and you argued for continuing Obama's policies toward Russia, strengthening NATO, um, and providing more support for Ukraine. And in the article, overall, I felt as if you were ar arguing for an abandonment of the U.S.'s illusions toward resetting the relationship or restoring the relationship with Russia. And so um, the question that I wanted to ask you is ultimately, what is the relationship that we need to have towards Russia, and is it bound to be hostile even beyond Vladimir Putin? Uh, 
I also had a second question for sure. you, and I'll make sure could, that could I, it's, it's very important, and I, I hope sure. I, I can ask. Negotiate um, with the someone, fellow behind yeah. you, actually. It, no, it's going to be very short. As no. someone who served in the Foreign Service for over 30 years, um, I'm sure you've, had, you've seen a great deal of change in the State Department. You've mentioned how there's been a gender imbalance that's been re restored, and you also mentioned the lack of diversity. Um, however, um, you didn't talk about how that's been addressed. And currently in the State Department, there's over 80% of our foreign service officers, our U.S. diplomats, who are white. Mm -hmm. um, and when you talk about the senior foreign service, it's even more. It's worse, uh, yeah. It's worse, exactly. And so I can't be help but to believe this is a disservice for how U.S. diplomacy is conducted. Yeah. And um, I wanted to ask, what can be done to change this, and how can we get um, our senior U.S. diplomats to implement the change? I mean, we have the best and the brightest in the State Department, and we have uh, ambassadors and diplomats who can negotiate with North Korea, who can negotiate with Iran. How is it that we can make a case, not just for diplomacy, but for diplomacy with diversity? Yeah. Thank you, and I'm sorry. Yeah, no, it's okay. No, both good, really good questions. And I'll, I, I promise I'll give brief answers. But Thank you for coming. I just had a quick question as far as your view on how the UN ambassadorship has oscillated since 1988 to today as far as being a cabinet level position under Republican administrations and then back down to kind of a senior ambassador to the rest, whether it was from Bush 41 all yeah. the way you know, to today and kind of what impact that has and does it provide balance in the cabinet if you have two diplomats kind of in the room with the Secretary of State, Secretary of State and the ambassador to the end, or, or is it better that there's just one kind of a key holder That's there? That's a good question, too. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you very much for your Hi. presentation. Sure. I'm a former Ukrainian ambassador. Hi. Nice to see you. And definitely, I know that you visited Ukraine in 2014. I did. And you were on Maidan. There's a terrible tragedy going on in my country. Thousands killed, maimed, millions deported. So, <clears throat> Do you see, as a professional diplomat, as a career diplomat, any chance of more involvement of the United States in trying to solve the conflict? Mm. Specifically, do you think that the U.S. can join the Normandy mm -hmm. process or any other process? Specifically, as now we will have perhaps a new president, mm -hmm. even with the old one, would also want the U.S. to be more involved. Mm -hmm. What is your vision of this issue? Thank you. Thank you. Well, all, all really good questions, and I'll try to answer them um, briefly, because it's my long answers, I think, that have droned on before. As a recovering diplomat, I can go on and on about <laughs> lots of things. We'll um, have you teach to, a course yeah. before you yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to answer. No, but to answer your question, sir, I think it's pretty transparent that what Vladimir Putin seeks in Ukraine is if, you know, first best option is a, differ a deferential government in Kiev. If you can't have that, the next best thing from Putin's point of view is a dysfunctional Ukraine. And so that's, that's what he's been trying to sow, you know, not just in the annexation of Crimea and the aggression in the Donbass, but also in the manipulation of the current election and lots of other things, too. I, I hope that the United States will get more actively involved. I, I think our principal European allies you know, involved in the Normandy process would actually welcome that, so long as we did it you know, in an in effective and a collegial way as well, because I think the leverage that we bring to the table um, helps focus the minds of the Russians as well. So you know, I hope very much that that'll take place. In terms of long-term vision, you know, I think the United States, as well as our European allies, have a deep stake in a healthy, sovereign Ukraine, a Ukraine that's able to regain control of its own territory and that has a strong enough political and economic system that it can resist you know, the efforts of Putin's Russia, a Russia that comes beyond Putin, um, to take advantage of its weakness and its vulnerabilities. So, and then on the question about the United Nations ambassador, um, you know, in my experience, it's really depended more on the quality of the person in New York and the nature of the administration. For example, our ambassador during the Bush 41 era was Tom Pickering, a wonderful American diplomat. He didn't have cabinet status, but he was probably one of the most competent and capable American ambassadors we've ever had at the UN. And it was a team that I think took full advantage of his skills. So I think what matters most is is the quality of the person there and how seriously 
that's taken. Now, one measure of that sometimes can be cabinet status, so it's not a bad thing at all. Um, but I think it's the quality of the person and the commitment of an administration um, to warts and all, you know, trying to make full use of the United Nations. Because I think we really run the risk right now of contributing to the atrophy of the United Nations with budget cutbacks and everything else. And that's something that I think we're going to regret. Is there an answer to your two questions? On, on Russia first, I mean, I think this is overly simplistic, but as important as it is, I think, not to give in to Putin's aggressiveness, I think it's important not to give up on the Russia that lies beyond Putin. Now, I'm not naive. You know, there's, there's going to be a sense of Russian exceptionalism in its elite, which is similar in some ways to America's you know, sense of exceptionalism. Um, so there's always going to be a kind of scratchiness, I think, in the way Russians look at you know, the United States as you look at over the next few years. But I don't think it has to be you know, as bad as the relationship is today. I think there's a middle class in Russia today that I think is restive in some ways. Not revolutionary, but restive. Because you know, Putin's old contract with them, which was basically, you stay out of politics, that's my business. What I'll ensure in return are rising living standards has kind of uh, collapsed because he's not ensuring rising living standards. So over time, I think, you're going to have thoughtful Russians who see a practical interest in healthier relations with Europe and ultimately with the United States. And I think Russians are going to chafe at being China's junior partner just as they chafed at being the junior partner of the United States right after the Cold War. So there's space for artful diplomacy there, I think, as time goes on. Um, and then your question about the State Department and the composition of the Foreign Service is a really important one because I've learned over many years of representing the United States overseas that we get a lot farther through the power of our example than we do through the power of our preaching. When we look like the society we represent in the diplomatic service, we're going to get a much better hearing for what we preach about open political systems, about respect for human rights. I mean, that has a powerful impact on people. So it's not only morally right to do that, it's also of great practical value to the United States. But what that means is, especially with the drift into reverse over the last couple of years on the painfully slow progress we've made before on better gender and ethnic diversity in the Foreign Service, it means leaders have to put a higher priority on that. And it, it, it can be overcome. You know, we've demonstrated ourselves we can make progress over time, but we need to accelerate that. Because I think we put ourselves at a disadvantage on the international landscape when we don't do that. And there's no reason. The Foreign Service has only about 8,500 diplomats, Foreign Service officers. You know, Bob Gates, the former Secretary of Defense, used to point out that there are more members of American military bands than there are Foreign Service officers. I have nothing against military music, but you know, there's an imbalance there. So it's a small institution, and in a way that should make it easier to make those kind of a changes. So I hope very much that you'll see in a new administration a renewed focus on those issues, because it does matter to the United States and to our ability to advance our interests and values in the world. Well, thank you so very much. I wish we'd had more time, but this was a fantastic conversation. Avril, thank you very Thanks. much. It was a marvelous Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much.